So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to this new way of uh, gathering for our Is San Diego sound? Regional Interfaith uh, Collaborative. Uh, we obviously historically met in person and um, the times call us uh, to a different way of being together. So I'm glad you're here. I'm Reverend Sharon Wiley of Chalice Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Escondido, and I am the board president of the San Diego Regional Interfaith Collaborative. So uh, again, I'm so glad you're here, glad to welcome you to this event. As you may know, our organization exists to host uh, two events a year, regional gatherings of uh, interfaith leaders to discuss topic, topical issues of importance to our San Diego community. Um, we hope that events like these uh, inform you, inspire you, um, call you to action, and help you um, build collaborative relationships with other interfaith leaders in the region. Uh, a quick heads up, uh, if you wanna make a note, we tentatively have our spring gathering scheduled for Tuesday, February 23rd. And uh, we tentatively expect that our topic will be related to domestic violence. Um, we're particularly thinking about um, the impact of domestic violence during this pandemic time when so many people are home more um, than they may have been previously. So I hope you'll add that to your calendars. Uh, our format this morning, you may have seen in emails that went out this morning. Uh, we have two wonderful keynote speakers. Uh, to share with us in this, with all of us in this main session, this main gathering. And then we're going to break into breakout rooms um, to hear from some of the uh, organizations in our region that are doing work on climate change. And so one of the things I will need to know from you is which breakout room you're going to want to be in so we can sort you into the right room. So there will be three rooms and I'm gonna post them in the chat. Um, so you can send a message. <clears throat> we, we have turned off chat for everybody so we can give our full attention to our speakers, but you are able to message those of us who are the host and co-hosts, my uh, other um, trustees, directors from the board of directors and um, if you can just message me, Sharon, on your little drop down menu, your, the number of the room you want to be sorted into, hopefully when it's time to do that, we'll be able to get you into the right room. Um, and I also want to say a quick shout out to our other uh, board uh, directors here. I wonder, let's do a quick, uh, if folks don't mind, um, if you're on the Cidric board, maybe I should call on you to be. <laughs> We're not getting anything from you, Sharon. Silence. I pressed my thing, that's why. <laughs> no wonder everyone's staring at me. Uh, <laughs> I'm asking the board of directors to just to say hello and give a wave. Um, so uh, Daniel Orth. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mary Farrow. Good morning, all. <laughs> Mo Winicky. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Rosemary Johnston. Good morning, glad to be here. Yusef Miller. Assalamu alaikum, good morning. And Margie Carroll. Good morning everyone, glad you're with us. Is there any board member here that I missed in that roll call? Great, so again, welcome, we're glad to have you here, and I will turn it over to uh, Rosemary to introduce one of our keynote speakers. Thank you very much, Sharon. We are honored to have with us this morning Dr. Ram Ramanathan, who's a distinguished professor of atmospheric and climate sciences at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, which is affiliated with UCSD. He discovered the greenhouse effects of CFCs, also known as Calora, fluorocarbons in 1975 and showed a ton of CFCs has more global warming effect than 10,000 tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, Dr. Ramanathan has a list of awards and commendations 
and books and articles as long as a football field. So I won't go into all that. We'd still be here at 12 uh, reciting all of them. But it's a great honor to have him here with us today. And I see him as a prophet for our own time. Uh, Abraham Heschel, the great uh, Jewish writer, once said that a prophet knows what time it is. And Dr. Ramanathan knows through his wonderful research and work that it's time for us to get serious about climate change and that the hourglass is emptying fast. He is a, uh, uh, worked with Pope uh, Francis prior to Pope Francis' uh, writing of Laudato Si, the uh, great uh, letter on uh, the environment, which was published in, uh, I think, 2015. So welcome, Dr. Ramanathan. Thank you for being with us today. We're e eager to hear from you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I, I really am looking forward to my interaction with all of you. So let me see if I can share my uh, screen. Uh, it says the host needs to give me permission to share screen. Give me a moment. Everybody's learning the technology. Mm -hmm. Oh. There we are. Oh, can you see my screen? Yes. Very good. Uh, Somehow it's not using, oh, let me just see. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about, uh, of course, climate change and really focus on why the moment is now for scientists to collaborate and form alliance with interfaith groups like uh, what you have. And that's exactly what we need. And I hope I can make that clear to you soon. We are in California. And of course, we can't talk about climate change without talking about our fires. <coughs> so this is, the, uh, this is about uh, three, four days into the Valley Fire, just in our backyard, about 20, 30 kilometers east of us, east and north. And I took this picture from my backyard around 6.30. The sun sets around 7, 7.15. So why is the sun so angry red? <laughs> Simply because uh, the soot, which comes out from the fires, yes, some of them are very tiny particles, almost like the COVID virus, a little bit bigger. Rob, Rob you need to get into the presentation mode. Oh, it's not in the presentation mode? No. Oh. So the little screen on the bottom of the PowerPoint. Is that, is that in the presentation mode now? That's much yes. better. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. OK. Uh, thank you, Tom. Tom, thank you very much. It would have been a, a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> And so what you see here is that those tiny particles from the smoke, of course, it travels all over. As you know, a week later, it was uh, over the East Coast. And uh, so that basically takes off the blue and the green from the light. And so that's why uh, all you're left with is the red color in the sun. So how do I know this? Look at this picture I took about, 10 day, about nine days later. So that's the color of the sun during around 6.30, okay? So uh, I'm showing this to show that how the smoke affects everything. What we see, what we inhale, thousands of miles away. It's a spectacular display of how we are all interconnected. Mm -hmm. So we are never gonna solve this problem 
if we don't recognize the fact emissions anywhere is global warming everywhere. So what does that mean? They're not gonna solve this problem by pointing fingers at each other. Uh, this is the time for all of us, no matter where we are, no matter where our cultural origin or religious origin or national origin, we all become brothers and sisters. And that's the only way we're gonna solve this problem. So I'm showing you the Valley Fire and what's the connection between these fires and climate change? And don't, don't be scared about that equation I have. I'm not going to give you a quiz on it. So the connection between fires and global warming is very simple. That uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing you can do on your kitchen. Just put a pan of water and turn on the power range. If you sit there long enough, the water will be gone. Where is that water? It just goes into the uh, air above in the kitchen and then outside as vapor. So that's what exactly is happening. That equation is what governs how much water is converted to vapor, okay? And uh, I have per personally tested it with satellites, instruments, I am shocked uh, and uh, the papers have been publishing over the last 25 years. That equation has the death grip on everything that happens in the planet when climate changes. What it tells you is that when the temperature of the planet increases, the evaporation increases exponentially. So water is evaporating from our soil, our tree trunks, leaves, every second, every hour, every day, throughout the year, okay? So when you don't have rain to balance that evaporation, things dry out. So skeptics tell, oh, you know, this fire is just cyclical. Yeah, fires are cyclical because when there is no rain, things dry out. But this is a chronic thing happening. When there's no rain because of global warming, it's, it's drying out even more. Of course, then the pine beetles, you know, or take bear whack at the uh, trees, they dry out even more than anything, a barbecue or lightning, or, or, you know, fire from the electricity, all of them, but just uh, uh, lighting that, that fire would have happened in any case, all right? So that's a connection. Things evaporate, water becomes vapor. Now, I just want to give you a small background uh, on why, what, what, what's causing the warming. Uh, you know, you take fossil fuel, it's basically hydrocarbon, right? Hydrogen and carbon, when you lit a torch or in your engine, you let, light a fire. The carbon in that fuel splits from the hydrocarbon, that's what releases the energy, but then it combines with the oxygen in the air and becomes carbon dioxide. It is probably one of the most insidious uh, gas in the air. Why is that? Then, For example, please go ahead. Is there a question? Yeah. yeah. So when, 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 let's say we took a, a car or bus and then we released this carbon dioxide from the tailpipe, that stays for a century. 50% of it stays for the 100 years and 20% stays for 1,000 years. So it's accumulated. How much have we emitted since James Watt invented the steam engine in the 18th century? Two trillion tons. Imagine that. About half of it is still in the air, about a one trillion ton. So it covers the planet like a blanket. Just like a blanket on a cold winter night keeps you warm by trapping your body heat. This blanket, trillion ton blanket, traps the heat coming from the earth and the air, and that's why things are heating up. It is inescapable laws of physics. Of course, this is also controlled by another equation. All of these we understand, okay? One thing you need to convey to your public is that climate change science is data-driven. 
I personally don't believe anything unless I can smell it or see it or measure it. Okay, now that's how most of my colleagues are. So where is this all going? Uh, we predicted uh, two years ago that the warming would amplify by another 50%. See, it took us 200 years to put the trillion tons of uh, carbon dioxide and that has already heated the planet by one degree Celsius for as of 2015. <clears throat> that warming in 10 years is gonna go from one to one and a half. So don't think of it as half a degree, who cares? Half a degree of one is 50%. So the planet has heated by one degree and it's gonna to go to one and a half. So we were the first to say that. And I think a lot of skepticism just uh, uh, two weeks ago in the UN summit, the United Nations agency declared, yep, we are going to see the degree of warming sooner. So what does that mean? Climate change is going to move into our living room, everyone's living room. So let me say, let me say what about that means. Either personally you will be affected by heat waves, or droughts or fires, or someone you know would be affected. And this has come close to me. You know, yesterday my daughter, who lives in Los Angeles, uh, she's working there. She was in tears, and, and we took an hour to console her because her close friend, their parents live in Santa Rosa, just lost their house in half an hour. They barely had time to escape. So <laughs> we had to console her saying that you should be happy. Your friend's parents are still alive. Okay. So this is no more waiting game. So don't think of it 2100, this and that. No, it's, it's, it's coming. It's already there. And I expect we'll take another five years to recover from COVID as we are, you know, breathing the, uh, deeply and relaxedly, oh, this darn COVID is behind us. This, we have to deal with this beast, climate change. So I think of COVID as a dress rehearsal for what's to come, okay? So if as a society, we don't do anything about it, this is the future we are looking at. This is the model prediction for what's going to happen 30 years from now. 30 to 40 years, that this is the planet and it shows drought. You can see most of Southwest is in the grip of mega drought, the whole of Amazon, the Mediterranean. So, you know, uh, the astronomers think of Earth as if we are in a Goldilocks zone, just at the right distance from the sun, just uh, with the right amount of gases in the air to keep the planet so beautiful for us, snow, water, and the rain. But that Goldilocks zone is going to be shrinking. Okay. So uh, I wouldn't show this, but uh, it's to my horror, I, as, uh, the, uh, as when I introduced this, that I published this paper 75, that's 45 years ago. And I've been waiting and waiting and waiting that society is going to pay attention. And unfortunately, uh, even those who are, understand and agree with climate science, they have not felt the urgency of this. <coughs> That's one of the most important message uh, friends like you can carry to the rest of society. So uh, I'm not all doom and gloom. Uh, it's still not too late. Plenty of scalable solutions are available. So we are not solving this problem, not because we don't know how to solve it. We know how to solve it, okay? And we have a decade to implement these solutions, but enormous investments are needed. So that's where we are stuck to accelerate this, okay? So after a long set of work, I, I, I'll tell you how I came to this conclusion. We need to form an alliance, science and policy with religion. 
why do we need religions to fight climate change? This is a, a meeting statement we came up with after a meeting I had organized at the Vatican, we bring Pope Francis. So we need to find, develop sustainable relationship with our planet. That requires a moral revolution. I'll tell you what moral revolution we need. Religious institutions can and should take the lead on bringing about such a new attitude towards creation. So how did I stumble into this? Uh, when I turned 60, I was sitting in, sorry, I was sitting in the middle of Maldives looking at uh, air pollution and how the ocean is heating up in the Indian Ocean. So I got this email message from the Vatican that uh, St. John Paul II, he was Pope uh, then, now he's St. John Paul II, invited me to join the Pontifical Academy of Science. There, attending meetings twice a year, I realized the power of this church in, in solving this problem. Through that, I realized the power of religions in solving this problem. So in 2014, uh, I worked with uh, another academic and the chancellor of the Pontifical uh, <laughs> Academy of Science, and we briefed Pope Francis. I was supposed to brief him for about 20 minutes. He got very busy. So all I had was two minutes to brief him. Oh my gosh. In the parking lot of the Vatican. Behind that, you see the St. Peter's Basilica. Behind Pope Francis is the dormitory. We all say he also stays in the same place. So I talked to him about the ethical, moral issues of climate change. At the same time, now, mind you, I'm 70 years old. That was a momentous year for me, uh, is that as I had the chance to be Pope Francis, the president of University of California asked me to team up with my academics and come with solutions to the climate change problem. And that's what we call bending the curve. This is a phrase we coined in 2015. So what, what we, that community, we came up with technological solutions. We need kind of policy solutions, but our top solution was societal transformation that we concluded climate disruption crisis requires fundamental societal transformation. And there are many ways to accomplish this. What you're doing is one of them. But uh, other thing we thought was education must be one of the pillars. And we said that education must start from pre-kindergarten and continue all the way to adulthood. And I, I, I want to just a little bit, uh, uh, you know, talk to you about what I'm doing there. So we, uh, University of California, all the 10 campuses we got together, I had the privilege of leading this group. We came up with this goal, we have to educate 1 million climate warriors, okay, to solve this problem. So we have created this education protocol for mainly uh, uh, undergraduate students. We created a digital book, you see the image of that. We created a hybrid course, we take lectures. Then we had an online version, which we are now using it because of COVID. And then a, mo a MOOC for adults, okay? But now I'm starting on this program called Climate Education for All. And uh, let me just set the a stage for that. And I'm, I'm that education for all, it's not like a course, it's send this spreading the message, particularly to those, those of our friends, brothers and sisters in Midwest and South who have difficulty with this issue. I think unless we bring them on board, we are not going to solve this problem. You know, we are in a democracy, we need majority support. So what's the entry point into faith? It's address the ethical and moral issues. And so that you community leaders can take the message that directly, okay? So let me address two uh, ethical moral issues. The first is the intergenerational equity. <clears throat> uh, in my research, I stumbled on this, that there are really two, two co-dependent worlds. 
One world is occupied by one billion. I am part of that. We live with unlimited access to fossil fuels, which is the source of the problem. <clears throat> but it's also a source of, let's not, uh, you know, uh, throw rocks at the fossil fuels. It's because of that we are enjoying the standard of living we are. Simply, it's become outdated. Contrast the top 1 billion with the bottom 3 billion who lack access to fossil fuels even for cooking. But now I know San Diego, uh, many children go hungry. So in the bottom 3 billion also belong a lot of poor in, in America, okay, just in our backyard. And second is intergenerational equity. See the climate change we are talking about is going to linger on for centuries, if not thousand years. So our children, grandchildren, and generations unborn will suffer the consequences of what we are doing at this time. So I show this image. Will you get on this plane if it has a one in 20 chance of crashing? We won't but our children and grandchildren have to get on that plane. Now think of that as the planet, okay? So those are the ethical moral issues why I think faith leaders are the most well equipped to address this. <clears throat> so I wanna just go conclude with what Pope Francis is doing. You know, in 2015, he commissioned a summit for city mayors around the world. And uh, I was part of the organizing committee. So I, as part of that, I had invited our governor, Jerry Brown, to join us. And on October 4th, that's this Sunday, I hope all of you will uh, read that. He's releasing a new encyclical. In, in, it's in Italian, but I think there's English translation. It's basically calling it brotherhood. What he's arguing for, is that we should think of our other species, the trees, all living beings, as our brothers and sisters. Because if, when there is a climate, climate cliff, they're gonna go first, many of those species. We are seeing our fires going down that cliff, or our forest. So he's asking us to develop a brotherhood with everyone on the planet, but also with species, okay? So uh, after that, uh, we are thinking of series of uh, uh, efforts uh, to spread that message. And, and let me just conclude, uh, this gives us some of the links of the things I talked about, our Twitter base, our MOCOS, BTC, et cetera. What I'm trying to do with this education for all is we have formed an alliance with various faith groups. Primarily now I'm, we are focusing on the Catholic uh, uh, Christian religion. And we want to work with them to develop education materials of about three to five minutes each, which the local preachers and local community leaders like you can use. So the question is, you already have that. Why do you need this or why do you need us? I think where we, we bring in is the fact that you will be able to say these, we were developed working with scientists who are working on this problem. So I think that gives, will give hopefully more, uh, 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 more power to persuade people. Thank you uh, uh, for inviting me. Thank you so much, Dr. Ram. And as folks hopefully saw in the chat, we will have um, question and answers after we've heard from both of our speakers. And so now I'll ask Youssef to uh, introduce Sonia Robinson. Hello, everyone. I'm Youssef Miller, and I have the esteemed pleasure to introduce Ms. Sonia Robinson. Sonia is is the chair of the Environmental and Climate Justice Committee with the NAACP San Diego. Sonia brings a perspective of grassroots organizing derived from the fundamental structure of organizational change development and project management, gained from her experience with global consulting firm 
Accenture. She applies her consulting and analytical skills in mobilizing measurable change in our environment and communities. She understands the importance of developing sustainable buildings where we spend 80% of our daily time. She's joined the public policy team of San Diego 350 to lobby bills and supports our environment and communities. As the chair of the EJC, she is, has lobbied countless efforts throughout San Diego County to bring sustainable climate justice. She was asked to lead the effort for community choice energy for the San Diego Council District. As a community energy organizer with San Diego County Choice Alliance, she worked diligently to bring awareness and support of the viable option community choice will bring to our communities. She was community choice. She saw community choice as a viable, uh, a viable network, which would infuse equity and bring sustainable economic benefits to Southeast San Diego. She believes that transformational energy will do far more for our community now and in the future. She believes in building support across communities in order to meet the, our sustainable goals as a solution. This includes environmentally sustainable buildings, energy democracy, transportation, and inclu inclusive green workforce. Mm. She has an internet radio show, Sun, Sustainable Urban Network, mm. addressing environmental justice on godradio1.com. It airs on Saturdays. She has, has been recognized by her work in sustainability and environmental justice by San Diego County Environmental Action Club, Indivisible, Women of Color Roar, along with legislators, U.S. Senator Kamala Harris and California State Senator Tony Atkins, and a recent accolade in 2020, the Unsung Hero Award from Climate Action Campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Sonia Robinson. Hi, everyone. Um, it is definitely an honor to speak to this group because my faith is something that is paramount and guides me. I want to say thank you to Dr. Rahm for, for giving us such a deep dive into a scientific uh, perspective. And I also want to share that what I'm going to share comes from more of a social, um, social justice perspective on why I am so passionate for environmental and climate justice. So welcome to all faith um, believers for everyone of all walks of faith. I wanna share some of my spiritual foundation with you, which is Christianity, that is my faith. And I do believe as um, Dr. Rahm has also shared that those that are faith believers, faith leaders, it is our duty to be good stewards of the earth. It is what our faith um, tells us to do, right? And I do believe that leaders of faith are fundamentally more viable candidates to act for justice, to act and to work towards not only social justice, racial justice, as well as environmental justice. And so in Genesis, it writes on good stewardship, and it reads that then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And that's Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. And so I believe that it is our duty, and it was God's intentions for us to be good stewards of the, war, of the earth. Producing equity, justice in our communities, addressing environmental and climate justice. I do believe that faith leaders and faith, leader and faith believers have a higher level of consciousness that may be seeking for real harmony, harmony in our faith, harmony in our beliefs, and in our interactions with one another, our response to environment, real harmony in our ecosystem. I do see that it's necessary as we're working to be congruent with Mother Earth. So again, I just want to share that my drive for doing this work is seeking justice in communities that look like me, communities that look similar to me, that unfortunately have contribute the least of injustices, but yet the burden is greater on our communities. And so 
I do share that um, while we're looking to be congruent, to produce equity, justice in our communities, while addressing ch uh, climate justice, another scripture reference is Psalms 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So as I stated before, that I believe that environmental and climate justice diversity um, and injustice directly intersects with racial justice, economic justice. And when we neglect a problem to take that has taken center stage, we're um, neglecting an opportunity to address things holistically. I believe it's our duty to respond. We have seen unfortunate racial justice injustices happening right before our eyes. It shows that we, it, it, it gives us an opportunity to identify who we are and who we wanna be and the actions to realize our true and best self in addressing all of this. So at times when we seek movements in life, movements as such as we see in today, movements, movements that reflect the very level of consciousness coupled with interactions to correct wrong. Let's not pretend we are actually in this very state at this very stage right now today, a crossroads in our society. The evolution of consciousness sometimes rides that you, we, that we are no longer just concerned about our own needs and meeting our needs and satisfying those needs, but our consciousness and concern is about our neighbors. It's about those that are at, at least of these, that we are also tending to those needs. And so that when we are seeing things that are happening in neighborhoods that we directly don't live in, it still affects us in our society. So that we may not personally un, um, experience it, but having compassion to those that do. And I believe that as faith leaders, that we may understand a deeper level of what that equilibrium for freedom and for rights that must include all of us. That we have populations of people, black and brown people, that stands in a need of realizing true justice. Our social agreement contract that all men, human, are created equal. Our social agreement contract here in America is our constitution. And so providing even some details and information as how this injustices affect in our climate needs. Some facts are, such as in 2020, it was found that 14 million people that are black, indigenous, and people of color in the United States live in areas with higher air pollution. There's empirical evidence that shows who actually causes the air pollution and those who actually breathe it. So now, just providing a little background of who I am and a little background of myself. So I actually grew up and as a minor, as a military dependent. And with most of those years being in California and more specifically here in San Diego County, it, is, it was an observation that I gained knowledge many years ago that God's word is a universal principle. Regardless of your um, faith and your background, those principles can be found in all religions. So because I grew up in such a diverse culture environment with friends of many different ethnic backgrounds and sometimes even different faiths, I, do, I did have an opportunity to see and learn that as human beings, we're more, more alike in what our needs are. We're more alike in many ways than we are necessarily different. Realizing that our beliefs, our religions may sometimes differ, but the justice that we need is still caused the same. I recall writing a paper my freshman year in college to try to identify and really figure out some of these differences. And I remember in reading and discovering that my Christian beliefs I would find in the Quran and I will also find in the Torah. And one of my revelations is just what I mentioned before, that God's word is a universal principle. It may be stated somewhat different, although I believe 
our beliefs as faith believers have a universal principle of justice. I remember this being reinforced in graduate school here at Point Loma Nazarene University. Such as I'm reminded in the Holy Bible, it states equity so graciously. And as so much you have done to the least of these brothers, you have done unto me. And that is found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. Now, it was also stated, some of my professional background and my upbringing, and it was at the global consulting firm Accenture is where I really got this fire inside of me, really got motivated in addressing environmental and climate justice when the senior partners invited me to be part of the green team. And eventually I became the editor in chief. And being the editor in chief and writing about tips and different ways that we can help in our own space to address climate and environmental issues I start adopting these ways and I start becoming more passionate about it, understanding that it also affects so many people that look like me. Now, that passion that I learned, I couple that with my organizational um, change development background at the firm, where I understand that there's different ways of measuring change. You have your operational change, your transactional change, and your transformational change. And I submit for consideration that we're in a crossroads today for transformational change for justice. Transformational change, change for justice, not only for our climate and environmental justice, but in order to really seek that, we have to address our racial and social injustice as well. So equity, what does that look like? Equity in providing resources to our communities that have suffered the most from climate and environmental injustice, and yet, as I mentioned before, contribute the least. Equity and climate justice, how do we shape, does shape our, our principles in life? Now, how do we let this shape how we contribute to equity? We provide opportunities, invest and hire our black communities and brown communities, communities of color, communities of concern. Did you know that race is the number one indicator in the United States of where toxins are located? I'll just let that sit for a minute. It is race is the number one indicator of where we'll find toxins. So in an effort of addressing it genuinely, we must apply equity to our marginalized communities in black communities. The fact that the amounts of pollution are more readily found in black communities, it is a serious problem. It is a problem that we must address collectively. So another fact is in 2019, it is stated that hotter neighborhoods are linked to racist housing practices. They are dated back in 1930s. We know that segregation by design and racial zoning was found illegal in 1917 by the Supreme Court, and yet the Fair Housing Act didn't become law until 1968. So when we're looking at these issues, understand that the urban heat index, it is a reality. The fact that the urban neighborhoods have less shading trees than the trees that are part of our social dominant cultures, it's a problem. And it must need, we must address it. It's unfortunate that the great diabolical of human history is coupled with human suffering. We can see human suffering. We know that we have good versus evil. And it's these good versus evil and human suffering that actually start shaping our principles. Equity, it means that we contribute to the level of the needs for the community's suffering. And that may mean that those members of communities suffering receive more because the facts are they've been left out for way too long. So we must act now to best assure solution. We must act now to best assure a just solution, not just a solution. To the crippling urban infrastructure that we see some parts of our county, such as South of Eight, Southeast San Diego, some of these areas are filled with waste, toxins, pollutions, lead, and other chemicals that is harmful to our health. There is something that I, something that you, something that we can do every day to realize the change that is needed. 
we, we have to be responsive to the needs of others. It is part of our faith belief that we must take care of our neighbors. To the needs of those of communities of color, to the needs of all of our neighbors, it, it, the action is for us to do the right thing. For those of you that may be feeling a little overwhelmed because there's just so much work to do, there's so much justice to be realized by certain populations in our country. I'll share this with you. And it says, a journey of a million miles starts with the first step by Lao Seuss. As well as understanding doing the right thing by our neighbors truly shouldn't be controversial, but rather just because we wanna do the right thing. And I share a quote by our Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that states, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. So again, I wanna say personally, that is through my faith that congruents me with my population and the collective um, population that I belong to. And we have different perspectives that we can consider JEDI. JEDI is our justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. A perspective of one, intent and impact. Two, being okay to be discomfort and you grow from those opportunities of learning. Three, self and societal transformation. And so I want you to imagine any discomfort you may feel in those of our brothers and sisters of our black and brown communities. For equity to be integrated in our environmental justice must be regenerative. Many of our community members are playing catch up. And for some, the disparity is just too great. Affordability, the cost of living in San Diego is a real issue. For some, it's a real place. I ask, that we support and prioritize communities of color in our movement for environmental and climate justice, effectively apply equity in a meaningful way, adopt sustainable thinking, address environmental justice, bad land use, zoning issues, health impacts, and insufficient resources for our people, our power, and our policy. Right now, tomorrow, our Board of Supervisors will be voting on having an environmental justice staff member. And I ask that you support that that happens. Also, we need to say yes and vote yes for Prop 16 for our people, power, and policy. And Prop 16 will reenact our affirmative action that is greatly needed in the state of California. It's going to take us as people, it's going to take our voices collectively with our votes combined with our power to influence uh, policy for equity. And so I will want you to consider some of these actions, uh, actions against exclusion and build inclusion. Build an equitable system that is inclusive with integrity and care. Care about your neighbor, my neighbor, and help improve our neighborhoods. Reimagine, rebuild for the full capacity of human sustainable development a sustainable economic growth that should, reflect, that should reflect promoting compensated work, jobs, careers, and stronger economy. Sustainability itself requires rethinking for, for advancement to address climate equity. Another fact is that 50% of Black, Indigenous, people of color live near toxic waste, as I stated earlier. Another fact is that San Diego County dumps more trash than any other person in the state of California. 5.5 pounds on a daily average. It is said that the Miramar landfills is predicted to be completely filled by 2030. This is something that we have to come together collectively and address. So it's from our beliefs, our values and our faith, I believe we need to act in wisdom from the heart. Our heart change to those that suffer in our society should be addressed with kindness and compassion and addressing the work needed to overcome distortions to address and produce realized justice. What is our vision as a collective society? A vision to honor, love, respect all humans. A vision that inclusive of the black community, a vision of true inclusion is an achievable direction and inspiration. So let's be deliberate in our thoughts and actions to help course correct wrongdoing. 
be inspired to take new and in some cases different choices that will help uplift our communities. Seeing what we're facing as a society, as a nation takes courage to stand for justice. For some it's easy, for others it's organic. For some it may feel like a dilemma. Yet I say that we're at a pivotal moment to truly do the right thing. Our pivotal moment in addressing our climate issues, our pivotal moment in addressing real justice is an opportunity for us to realize the vision of this country that all men are created equal. All humans have the right of liberty, justice, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Sonia, thank you so much for that um, inspiring talk. And Dr. Rama as well, thank you so much for your informative presentation earlier. Uh, again, my name is Daniel Orth. I'm a board member with the San Diego Regional Interfaith Collaborative, um, and I'm really honored to be able to facilitate some Q&A and discussion with our two keynote speakers this morning. Um, we've got about 15 minutes or so for that discussion. Um, with around 50 folks here this morning with us, I'd request that if you have a question um, or a comment for either Dr. Ram or for Sonia or for both, um, please direct those to me via the chat box. Um, I think it might get a little uh, messy if we're all trying to talk and ask questions at the same time. So if you have a question or a comment, please direct them to myself, Daniel Orth, in the chat box, um, and then I'll uh, ask them of our speakers. Um, in about 20 minutes, we will be breaking off into our breakout rooms. If you haven't already um, sent uh, Sharon Wiley your preference for those breakout rooms, um, please do so now as we're getting into our Q&A. Um, again, that's room number one will be our San Diego Association of Governments. Um, room number two will be the North County Climate Change Alliance. And in room number three, uh, San Diego 350 and the Interfaith Coalition for Earth Justice. So if you haven't already indicated your preference for the breakout room to Sharon Wiley, um, please do so now so that she can organize us into our, our different spaces. Um, so one question to get us started, and it came in in part from another uh, participant, and then I was also thinking this too, but Dr. Robin Sonia, both of you spoke about um, you know, moral revolution, about the need for being good stewards and justice, um, kindness and compassion. I'm wondering if both of you could speak to the question of what have you found to be the most compelling arguments, maybe arguments is the wrong word, most compelling appeals to get people to appreciate um, the severity of the situation and the need to take action. Uh, you know, how do we get people on board? What is the what is the best way that we can deliver to our congregations, to our neighbors, whoever, um, about this situation? I'd like to hear uh, Sonia's answer to that, then I'll give mine. Mm -hmm. She probably has a more direct experience, and I could learn. I could learn from it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ram. Um, it's a pleasure. So I feel like um, awareness is definitely necessary and not just awareness, but then understanding, understanding the intersectionality. So one thing that really <clears throat> continues to keep me motivated is doing work that impacts the masses, right? Um, doing work for those that don't know who we are. So I teamed up with San Diego 350, Climate Action Campaign, and many other of our Climate Avengers, that's one of my son's coined term, um, uh, 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 eliminating an opposed bill, a proposed bill by sdg and &E of a minimum bill of like $38, right? And so, for an example, when we met with all these different state legislations, you know, because San Diego County is the second largest county in our, in our state, right? And so when we met with all these um, legislations, taking it from an economic injustice, was one that was recommended that we continue. I mean, that was my position, right? Because there are people that have studios, one bedroom apartments that wouldn't even generate $38 worth of electricity. And so then we'll be billed that amount, right? And so that's a form of injustice. So awareness, understanding, and understanding that intersectionality and a heart and willing to do things for the masses that may not even know that you're making decisions, if you're in, in a place of power, that you can actually um, in, insert justice in ways that those that benefit won't even know who you are. So you're looking at the greater good, if, if I may. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ram, anything you wanna add as well? Yeah, so <clears throat> what, I, what I found 
is that uh, people are very receptive when you reach out to them. But they need to be persuaded that first you are sincere, the speaker has to be sincere. And the second is, uh, from my viewpoint, they trust the uh, science and uh, I, meaning, <clears throat> sorry, uh, my computer went off the screen. Uh, I just want to give one small uh, example. I was in Omaha, Nebraska in the middle of a winter uh, last year. And there were 750 people who showed up to a talk on uh, global warming in the middle of a bitter winter. And uh, about you know, 30 or 40 of them drove from Kansas from the border. <clears throat> and invariably the response I get from them, I, I, after my talk, I meet the 20 or 30 in person. I had the same experience when I talked to the evangelicals in San Diego, about 250 of them or two years ago. They always said, Dr. Ram, we didn't know there is so much science behind this. We didn't know there is so much data to support what you guys are saying. So I take that as an example that uh, I, I don't agree with what I hear about people from Midwest and South, or they already made up their mind. No, I think they've been fed wrong information. It's up to people like us to take them that information and convey it, not in grandstanding talks and things like that, but on small community type conversations. So that's why I came up with this idea of education for all, working through faith communities and let them deliver the message, but give them scientific backing so that we can unpack climate change from all the things that divide this country. You know, we got put into that liberal box so climate change became part of the same thing like gun control and others which divide us. And so we need to unpack it and we need to convey that this is going to be immense human suffering. And I agree with Sonia, I think uh, the black and the brown Hispanic community are gonna hit hard hit, not 50 years from now, five, 10 years from now with heat waves fires when that becomes one to one and a half there's nothing we can do unfortunately to stop it we can stop from getting it worse and uh, i just don't know how californians are going to cope with it particularly those young people those who are middle class lower middle class and then those you know vulnerable communities we need to have a massive massive program of building resilience in those communities. I completely second what Sonia said. The, the black community live in some of the most polluted regions, all over, you know, refiner, refineries, nasty industries are in their communities. Um, thank you both. Um, a question came in kind of building off of this topic. Um, as we're thinking about engaging more and more people into this effort, into this movement, um, how do we make sure that uh, we are building an inclusive uh, movement to address climate change? How do we make sure that, um, you know, marginalized communities, the communities that are going to be hardest hit by this are, are part of this effort? I mean, Sonia, you talked about intersectionality, but you also talked about, you know, the diversity of justice issues that many of these communities face. You know, how do we make sure that you know, we're able to bring those communities into this conversation and really make them a part of uh, the climate change discussion. And Sonia, maybe we'll start with you again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, Daniel. <laughs> so I appreciate that question. And so inviting us, right? So there's a, a few things. So there are some of us is already here, even in San Diego County, you know, Yusuf is one of them. He's part of my, you know, of our environmental and climate justice committee. So the NAACP, just to give you some background, They've existed here in San Diego, or the San Diego branch has existed for 101 years. Although this has only been a year and a half that we had our Environmental and Climate Justice Committee, which I, you know, developed from ground up. So I say that to say that, you know, 
this committee hasn't always always existed, but there's always been people in our communities that done the work, right? From a food scarcity issue, from food justice, um, environmental and climate, inviting us not only to the table, but put in positions of decision making, put us at the table of, of decision making, right? In addition to that, I will also share on the flip side of that, some Blacks are unaware that our lifestyles has been environmental because no one really taught us or gave us that framework, right? So our lifestyles of being environmental came from a place of um, survival, right? Of making sure our lights are turned down, um, using less energy than we have to, uh, preserving, you know, and recycling food and, and repurposing, you know, products. Like, you know, even I had this, um, this candle holder. Well, instead of throwing it out, or because I wasn't going to use it, I just stuck, use it as my like bracelet holder, right? So like repurposing. So a lot of it is also from an education perspective of awareness, you know, for a lot of our Black communities to understand that we've been acting as environmentalists, but no one gave us that framework, that terminology for us to know in order to be brought in. I also believe that, and one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this, I strongly believe that the traditional ways of working for justice is needed and required. Hence, we're seeing what's happening. But I also see from an environmental, addressing an environmental and climate justice, it's almost like a remix of traditional social justice, right? It's another um, lens, if you will, of how to address that issue. And I think that hopefully as I'm trying to make it more uh, appealing as well as the work of all of us trying to make it more appealing to galvanize more supporters but understand there's already a baseline of supporters invite us to the table invite us in those discussions and we will also be contributors and add value thank you thank you Sonia yeah I know my, my grandmother hung up paper towels to dry and it wasn't because she was an environmental crusader right um, Dr. Ram, you spoke a little bit about the importance of using faith leaders to be those messengers. Um, do you want to contribute anything to hear about, you know, how we make this movement inclusive? I don't know if I have much to add beyond what uh, we heard from uh, Sonia already. I, I think the inclusiveness comes, for me, that's... Uh, beyond all the things we heard from Sonia, I, the inclusiveness is, is survival. I'll give you just one simple example, okay? Uh, I showed about 3 billion who have no access to fossil fuel. They are contributing to climate change at just 5%, the pollution. And, and we know, uh, right, who is gonna suffer the worst, but if we leave them behind, including the poor and vulnerable people in the US and we just convert everything to renewable and they continue on their own, whatever they can find, you know, in the uh, developing countries, it's gonna be burning wood or fossil fuel, that's the cheapest. We show their pollution, the pollution of the poorest 3 billion about 20, 30 years from now would be enough to heat the planet so no life would be possible. So you see, that, that is where it is co we are codependent. So there's, a, there's, a very, there's a very practical dimension to right. inclusivity is right. necessary in order to be successful. And the second thing is that uh, the recent work suggests because of the fires, I, you know, we are focusing on California fires. Amazon is burning away this year, right? they're expecting 10 to 15 million climate refugees from Central America alone across the border. And we are choking and putting walls for just 1 million from Central America. So I worry about systemic collapse of the American governments. So because we are going to have brothers and sisters across the border. So I think I see it as a necessity for our survival, we take care of them. Um, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for probably one more question, depending upon how long um, our responses are to this. It, it is a pretty tricky one, so this might take us to the end of our Q&A. But by far the, the most questions or comments that I've gotten in, in my chat box here relate to bringing our elected officials, bringing our politicians on board to address this challenge. Um, 
you know, I think a lot of us have recognized that, you know, driving a hybrid car or recycling is not going to create the sort of large scale change that we need in order to stop um, climate change in order to bend the curve, Dr. Ram. Um, how do we how do we effectively engage our elected officials, our politicians, to create the kind of policy changes, the kind of legislation that's really what we need in order to, you know, address this challenge? And Dr. Ram, why don't we start with you this time um, to mix things up? So again, the question is about, you know, what do we do to engage with our elected officials, our policymakers, to enact the kind of large scale change that we as a as a society need in order to stop this? Okay, uh, I have to say that you are in an extremely dangerous territory. You, you, you don't realize what you're committing to. I have a ton of things we all can do. I have a long list. But I'll give you one idea. I was thinking, just listening to uh, your questions and Sonia's fantastic talk on social justice. I've never heard something like that. And with so many information facts, is it possible that this group, you know, we develop uh, one or two pages and submit it to our government and even send it to uh, the uh, governor that you see what I see politicians are doing is in a crisis management mode. Oh, I'm just going to take care of this fire this year. Okay. I'm going to send 100 helicopters. I'm going to get people from Australia and others to help me. I've not heard anyone plan that it's going to get at least minimum 50% worse in 10 years. And, and, and I would not be surprised. Our region is subject, subject to the same massive fires like Santa Rosa, right? So, we need to do two things. On the one hand, we need to cut our emissions. I think California is doing an amazing job. But what I see it not doing is building resilience. What, how, how are the people here, if you don't have fire insurance, so the insurance becomes so expensive, what are we going to do? You know, I, I, I am a well-paid professor. If I don't have insurance for my house, I would be in serious trouble. So we are all thinking, oh, this is not going to affect us. It's some people sitting, you know, poor. No, it's going to affect all of us. What is that resilience plan the government has to protect us? And I think we need to sensitize them. See, what, what I think they are thinking is we cut our emissions to zero. The problem is gone. Now, because this is a pollution anywhere, is global warming everywhere. Even if one state is putting these gases, it's going to heat up all of America. So, so we need to build that resilience that's become so urgent now. And how are we going to deal with a, a vulnerable population living next to refineries, breathing that stuff? Now COVID has made it clear air pollution, people inhaling air pollution are going to be more impacted by COVID. Right? So I think we need one thing. I, if I had a chance to talk to the our mayor, I would tell him, please put a lot of water fountains in vulnerable downtown. That's what we are going to need. People drinking water. You will be shocked. You know, California had a 130 degree heat wave, right? It has never happened anywhere in the planet. If that hits San Diego for three days, imagine. So we need to think about those things. It's not hopeless. I think we can build resilience, but we got to start now. So I would think of communities like this, teaming up with scientists and policymakers and developing our, let's not wait for the government top down, let's do bottom up. Thank you, Dr. Ram. 
um, if this group can get our elected officials to think beyond the next election cycle, I think we'd become <laughs> national celebrities, but um, that's, a, that's quite a challenge. Um, I should say too, as a shameless plug for the San Diego Regional Interfaith Collaborative, you know, one of our hopes and goals in, in convening these events every year is that we do create some momentum and some connections that people are able to leverage to create change on these issues that we're facing. And um, certainly the 50 plus people who are joining us this morning are, are interested in this issue and committed to taking some action. So hopefully, um, noon today is just the the beginning of the or the end of the beginning rather and and the work continues yeah um Sonia your thoughts please on that question you know how do we get our elected officials our politicians to to care and pay attention I definitely agree with Dr. Rahm as far as resiliency you know having a climate action plan um, I love his point of having the scientists the social justice people and the policymakers collectively happening and I also appreciate what he shared about those downward impacts you know that you know because you think it's not going to come to your area but we all know that we're you know interconnected right so there's those downward impacts that you may not consider one of the things I would say is meet with your meet with your legislators right because they are supposed to be representative of you as a constituent. Not only meet with them and, and, and share what is important to you and let them see the, um, the strength and numbers that you have on a particular topic, on a particular area, but in addition, is vote the ones in that will stand for climate, you know, social justice, right? Those that are actually hold their feet to the fire. And we have to, so on one hand, we have to elect those that will take this seriously. Because I understand that the cry for climate was happening definitely in the 60s before I was born, right? And even potentially before then, but no one was able to see those impacts. So we just kept, you know, fossil fuel, we kept burning up, we kept, you know, the coal, we just kept dirtying up our planet until we're at a point now where we're looking at 12 years or less that we really got to make some transformational change to bend the curve to Dr. Ron's point, right? So I believe that meeting with all your elected officials, your, you know, for municipal um, aspects, so your city councilman, your mayor, your deputy mayor, your um, city council member, knowing what your district, your senator, your legislators, you know, assembly members. So I have collect. I have done this not just single-handedly, but definitely from a collective community. And I do believe it's going to take a, co a collective community so they can see a broad range of their constituents that say that this matters. And so, I'm actively working on something now for public power, so we can, co you know, course correct some of these issues in order for us to use the renewable energy that we know that's going to be better for all of our residents and our ratepayers. So. I definitely believe building that people power, just what Dr. Rom said, from the bottom up. And I also agree with him that really good leadership should be projecting, you know, not like he said, not just putting out the fires, I mean, figuratively and then unfortunately, literally, right? But not just putting out the fires right now, but able to project what your need is, as he stated, 10 years, 20 years down the road and build that roadmap. So even under your leadership, you may start it, from a legislative policy perspective, but you're expecting that trend to go forward because we saw the trends of injustice happening. We saw the trend of um, the roadmaps of the rich get r richer, the, the planet gets dirtier, right? So we saw that roadmap and it's time that we can actually apply a roadmap for cleaner energy, apply a roadmap to be good stewards of the earth and that knowing that under your legislative um, leadership, it's not going to complete the path, but you're at least on the right roadmap and you plan to ha you know, have a baton pass to the next person to continue on for the next 20 years or so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sonia and Dr. Um, thank you both so much for, for being with us this morning and sharing your inspiring words, your expertise, your, your vision, your wisdom, um, and helping to, to motivate us and give us some, uh, some, some tools to be able to engage with our communities, engage with our policymakers, our elected officials. Um, one of the other goals that we have at the San Diego Regional Interfaith Collaborative is to identify opportunities for um, San Diego faith leaders, San Diego faith communities to get involved in these issues that are facing our communities. And so we were very intentional in selecting um, our, our organizations, our speakers for our breakout rooms this morning. Um, so that they have some concrete ideas for ways that you can get involved, things that you can do, 
um, to start working on some of these challenges. And so in just a moment, we'll be heading off into three different breakout rooms to meet with those individuals. I'm sure that you're like me and wishing that you could go to all three um, and are really curious to hear what's going to happen in, in all three of these rooms. Um, we'll be sharing some of the, the resources, some links, um, some ways to get involved from all of our presenters, including Dr. Ram and Sonia, um, via our Cidric webpage, as well as our Facebook page. So if you haven't already liked us on Facebook, um, if you haven't been to our website, please do so. Um, we're putting some more information up there. We'll also be sending an email out to everyone who registered this morning um, to get your survey feedback on how we did, how this event was. As Sharon said earlier, this is our first go at, uh, at hosting one of our gatherings on Zoom, and, and we'd love to hear from you how that went. Um, so please do take a moment to complete that, um, that feedback survey um, to give us your thoughts. And in that email again too, we'll also be linking to some of the resources um, that our, our presenters have been able to share with us. So um, I just wanna say thank you all so much for being with us this morning. If I don't see you in, in the breakout room, um, I look forward to uh, to becoming a Jedi Master, as Sonia said, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, a Jedi Master with all of you. I couldn't uh, let that pass without making a, a nerdy Star Wars joke. So, um, <laughs> um, so thank you all so much. Um, Sharon is going to be sorting us into our breakout rooms, and so I think we'll all be be disappearing here from in a moment from the main room, um, but looking forward to some spirited discussion um, in our in our separate groups then. I, I am just about to sort of say, and, but Mo wanted to add some words of encouragement as well. Yes, I did. I just wanted to follow up on uh, Daniel's shameless plug for Sidric and uh, encouraging people to uh, maybe form coalitions uh, and to get things done. When we first started doing these events, Sidric, um, years ago, the feedback we got from our surveys immediately was that people weren't coming up with anything that they could do. We were just presenting a program and there was nothing that they could do. And so we addressed that. And one of the things we did when we were doing in-person gatherings is we were sitting people geographically rather than by their, or letting them sit where they wanted to sit. If we let them sit where they wanted to sit, then all the Methodists sat together, all the Unitarians sat together, all the Lutherans sat, and everybody got caught up on things that they you know, missed from long ago. But that wasn't really what we were after. So we started seating people by their geographic locations in the county. So now we're putting people together that they didn't know each other. Uh, but they were now meeting folks in their community. And this was all to encourage uh, folks who have uh, uh, common concerns in their communities and perhaps encourage a dialogue and coalitions where they could work on issues in their own community. We also then started doing, in conjunction with these events, breakout rooms. The breakout room is the opportunity, if you're looking for something to do, this is the place to learn what to do. So I would encourage you in your breakout rooms to um, uh, get a map on things that you can do to help make a difference. That's it, thank you, Sharon. The rooms are open. You should have messages on your screen and have fun in there.